before I tell you what year and where today's case took place, I would first like to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, Historic Mail. If you love history as much as I do, then you'll love Historic Mail. If you haven't heard of them, they connect you to the past through the lost art of letter writing. Every week, you'll receive an envelope delivered to your doorstep containing a meticulously crafted reproduction of a letter penned by an important historical figure. The letter also comes with the documents, providing historical context and a typed version of the letter. I've been enjoying reading my weekly letters, and it's so interesting getting to learn about the inner lives of great historical figures, right from the source. If you are more of a lover of American history, then you can't miss out on their American History gift pack. This covers from 1776, with the founding of the Republic, all the way to 1976, with the Cold War at its height. It features letters from presidents such as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, as well as other important historical figures. Historic Mail offers 10 weekly letters for only $59.99. There are also letter packs for 25 letters and a yearly pack of 52 letters for more in-depth exploration through various periods of history. Historic Mail is a perfect gift for history lovers. This holiday season, surprise your loved ones with this timeless gift. Enjoy 10% off on all their products with their Christmas sale. Go to historicmail.com forward slash briefcase to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Now let's go to 1920s USA. Martha Ginka was born on the 18th of April 1883 in the very small town of Hardscrabble in Medina County in Ohio. Despite her father Wilhelm and her mother Sophie dedicating themselves to their small farm, economic hardship shadowed the family. Along with two brothers named Frederick and Paul and her sister named Emma, Martha bore the weight of financial struggles during her childhood, a time marked by relentless toil and hard work. Her school life was also marked by challenges. She was not a very academic student, and she also lacked what society deemed to be conventional attractiveness. She became the target of teasing, bullying, and abuse from both family and townsfolk. These relentless experiences took their toll on her in her early years. In 1906, a turning point arrived when Martha met Albert Wise, a man quite a few years her senior. She met him at a box social event, which were very popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, especially in rural communities. At these gatherings, participants, typically young people, would prepare a meal or some food items and place them in a decorated box. These boxes were then auctioned and sold anonymously to attendees. The person who bought a particular box would then share a meal with the person who prepared it. Albert was the highest bidder on the box prepared by Martha. They courted for a short while before marrying and Martha became Mrs. Martha Wise. Although somewhat strangely, Albert failed to give his new wife the customary wedding ring. Martha moved onto his 50 acre farm but quickly discovered that he desired not just a wife but also a farmhand. Being married, however, brought little relief for her. She was still burdened with financial struggles, just as she always had been when growing up in her parents' home. She worked relentlessly in the fields. Even during pregnancy, she tackled tasks usually assigned to men, such as plowing and tending hogs. This was all done alongside the routine household chores, such as baking and cleaning. Over the next few years, Martha gave birth to five children, Tragically, the couple's first child died when very young, but four others, named Everett, Gertrude, Kenneth and Lester, all survived infancy. Martha's refuge during this time became the sombre atmosphere of funerals. Almost without fail, she attended every funeral held in Hardscrabble and the surrounding areas. She would show up, whether she had a personal connection with the departed or not, when questioned about her peculiar interest. Martha offered a simple explanation. She liked funerals, but her life took an unfortunate and unexpected turn in 1922 when her husband, Mr. Albert Wise, suddenly died. Martha was only 39 years old and found herself a widow and responsible for the upbringing of four children. 
Strangely, however, the death of Alberts only seemed to amplify her eccentric behaviour. The fixation on funerals became more pronounced as her grief manifested in an openly emotional manner. Once a silent observer, she transformed into an active participant in the mourning process. Her attendance was not merely a formality. She openly cried and lamented at every funeral, regardless of the relationship she may have had with the deceased. This shift in behaviour added an intriguing layer to Martha's story and left the community both puzzled and intrigued by the widow's newfound and openly expressed grief in these solemn occasions. In the aftermath of Albert's passing and amid the shadows of sorrow, Martha found comfort in a worker from a neighbouring farm named Walter Johns. The two started to see each other often and Walter became a significant presence in her life. However, their relationship faced much disapproval from Martha's family, particularly from her mother Sophie and her aunt Lily. They made their reservations about the new man in her life very clear, expressing a fervent desire for Martha to sever ties with him. The conflict between the pull of newfound love and the push of family disapproval added a layer of complexity to Martha's already tormented life. She was torn between the whispers of societal norms and her own personal happiness. However, in mid-1924, she reluctantly yielded and ended the relationship. Walter relocated to Cleveland, and as a result, they never saw each other again. On Thanksgiving evening in 1924, a shadow fell upon the family gathering as a severe stomach ailment struck several members. This included Martha's own mother, Mrs. Sophie Harsell, while most recovered with time, Sophie's condition only worsened, and on the 13th of December, the poor lady died. The untimely passing of Martha's mother cloaked an overwhelming shroud of sorrow over the family. The year drew to a close, marked not only by the arrival of New Year's Eve, but also by the ominous recurrence of illness. Martha's uncle and aunt, Mr. Fred and Mrs. Lily Ginka, along with their children, also became very sick suffering from the same stomach pains that had plagued Martha's mother before her death. On the 4th of January 1925, Martha's Aunt Lily died, and four days later, her uncle Fred suffered the same fate, leaving a void that echoed with tragedy. As the illness spread through the extended family, hospital visits became a grim routine, and as the weeks passed, there seemed to be no relief. The mysterious ailment did not discriminate, affecting a total of 17 of Martha's relatives, who all suffered eerily similar symptoms. Among the chilling aftermath, four of the Ginka children were left partially paralysed, their lives forever altered by the enigmatic and devastating illness that had befallen their family. The once celebratory seasons now bore the weight of sorrow and the haunting echoes of that turbulent time lingered in the family's history. In the wake of this family tragedy, the authorities delved further into the deaths. They wondered if something more sinister was at play, especially as so many family members had died in such a short space of time. Taking charge of the investigation was a county sheriff, a man named Fred Roshan. He sifted through the evidence, spoke to local people and surviving members of the family he mapped out a timeline in which all of these tragic deaths occurred and soon a chilling revelation emerged. The focus of the investigation then turned to Mrs Martha Wise. County Prosecutor Seymour unearthed a series of purchases of large quantities of arsenic which she had signed for at a nearby drugstore. The body of Martha's aunt Lily was exhumed and it was during the subsequent autopsy that the grim reality started to emerge. The findings conclusively revealed the presence of arsenic in her digestive tract. Martha's house was searched and chemists looked at the cooking utensils which she may have used to prepare food for the victims. Upon them, small traces of arsenic were found, with mounting evidence pointing to Martha. On Wednesday the 18th of March, 1925, the sheriff brought her in for questioning. At first, she denied having any involvement in the deaths asserting that the arsenic she had purchased was intended for nothing more than rat extermination. However, under the weight of scrutiny, Martha's resolve crumbled and she confessed to a chilling plot. She admitted to poisoning her own family members 
by surreptitiously introducing arsenic into water buckets and coffee pots, the very vessels from which they unwittingly drank. She said that she had poisoned her mother's water bucket on the 27th of November, which was Thanksgiving, and she poisoned her uncle and aunts on New Year's Eve. She said she frequently went to their farm to get milk. She confessed to an irresistible allure towards attending funerals, revealing that in the absence of a sufficient number of ceremonies in the community, she felt compelled to instigate them herself by poisoning her family. She also confessed to other crimes, including burning buildings near her home and stealing jewellery. The revelation sent shivers through the community as the layers of deception and tragedy were peeled back to expose a chilling betrayal within the confines of family and trust. People wondered how she could have done this, especially as she was a mother to four young children who at the time were aged 14, 11, 10 and 7. Martha Wise was arrested and charged with murder. The trial began on the 4th of May 1925 and the defence did not deny that Martha had committed these terrible acts, but argued that she did this as she was in fact suffering from insanity. They also told the courts that Martha had been coerced into committing the murders by her former lover, Walter Johns. The defence, however, encountered a series of setbacks and the proceedings were marred by the tragic events of the 6th of May when Martha's sister-in-law, Edith Hassel, took her own life. Following this, Edith's now widowed husband Fred collapsed in a state of grief and was deemed not well enough to appear in courts. Both individuals had been prepared to testify in favour of the defence. The announcement of Edith's demise appeared to leave Martha unmoved. She remained impassive, not lifting her gaze upon receiving the news. Throughout a significant portion of the trial, she kept her eyes fixed on the floor. Even when Marie Ginka, who had been paralysed by the poison that Martha had allegedly administered, was wheeled into the courtroom, Mrs Ethel Roshan was an important witness. She was the wife of the Medina County Sheriff and also the jail matron who had been overseeing the defendant since her arrest. Mrs Roshan told the court that Mrs Wise had confessed to administering the poison that had caused the death of her mother, Mrs Sophie Hassel, and her uncle and aunts, Mr Fred and Mrs Lily Ginka. Mrs Roshan went on to say that Mrs Wise had said that she first put the poison in the water buckets at her mother's home, before trying to do the same in the home of her uncle and aunts. However, the courtroom gasped as Mrs Roshan finished by saying that Mrs Wise had told her that the devil made her do it. Complicating matters further, a pivotal witness named Mr Franz Metzger recanted his testimony during cross-examination, revealing that the defence had pressured him to perjure himself in order to support claims regarding the defendant's mental states. However, two doctors confirmed that they believed Mrs Martha Wise to be insane. One was Dr Henry John Abel, who had been Mrs Wise's physician since 1898. He told the court that although in recent years he had no longer conducted general practice, she had always insisted on seeing him. He said that her behaviour on these visits led him to believe that she was indeed insane. Miss Emma Ressinger, who was Martha's primary school teacher, told the court that as a child, Martha had always found learning to be very difficult and her conduct was always erratic. Martha chose to take the stand in her own defence. This was despite family members, including her own son Lester, and three of the Ginkers' children testifying against her. The trial unfolded as a dramatic saga, with a web of interpersonal relationships, psychological intricacies and unexpected turns, which added to the courtroom drama. When all the evidence had been presented and the prosecution and defence attorneys had summed up their case, the jury were sent out to deliberate. They did so for just one hour before they returned to inform the court that they found Mrs Martha Wise guilty of first degree murder. However, they recommended mercy for the defendant. Taking everything into account, the judge sentenced Mrs Martha Wise to life imprisonment, under the terms of which she could only be freed by executive clemency. Martha was returned to the county jail before being sent to serve her sentence at the Ohio Reformatory for Women, a correctional facility in Marysville. After her trial, Martha levelled accusations against her ex-lover, 
Mr. Walter Johns, who had since relocated to the city of Cleveland. On the 15th of May, the police apprehended him, placing him under arrest on a warrant for first degree murder. However, five days later, he was released after he managed to persuade the state prosecutor of his innocence. In 1962, 37 years after being incarcerated, a glimmer of reprieve emerged for Martha. As testament to her good behavior while in prison, the governor of Ohio chose to commute her sentence from first degree to second degree murder. This decision paved the way for Martha's parole at the age of 79, offering a glimpse of freedom after years of incarceration. However, the prospect of going back into the community proved elusive for her, despite her advanced age and the expectation of support from her children. Her family refused to help her. Attempts were made to find her a place in a residential rest home for the elderly, but these requests were met with rejection. Within a mere three days of her release, Martha found herself back within the confines of prison, grappling with the harsh reality of nowhere else to go. Her parole was then revoked, extinguishing the brief hope she had of spending the remaining years of her life a free woman. The intricacies of her post-parole struggle paint a poignant picture of someone beholden to legal decisions, society's reluctance to help her, and the challenges that accompanied her advanced age. Martha spent the next nine years in prison until her death on the 28th of June, 1971, at the age of 88. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case